I am pleased to introduce to you Mr. Kent Bai. Kent is a journalist who started a podcast called Voices of VR. It has over a thousand episodes, and when people ask me who Kent is, I say he is the institutional memory of the XR industry. Kent is going to give us a lightning talk on philosophical frameworks for the metaverse. Thank you, Kent. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about some philosophical reflections on privacy from an XR journalist. Um, I'm Kent Bai, I've been doing the Voices of VR for, since May of 2014, recorded over 2,000 interviews uh, and published uh, over 1,100. And uh, there's gonna be a lot of slides that I have, and if you wanna look at, on Twitter, at Kent Bai, the first post that I have there, uh, you can take a look at those slides to, as a reference, and so don't stress out too much there. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about my journey into XR ethics, and each of these different sections are gonna be covering different aspects of privacy. So uh, back in 2016, Upload VR did a, a, a story about how Oculus had this always-on service that caught the attention of Al Franken, and at the very next conference, the, the community was abuzz talking about the privacy implications of XR, and so since May of 2000, uh, 2016, I've done over 50 interviews about privacy. Uh, in XR, and in 2018, with Jeremy Balenson, um, Phil Rosedale, and Jessica Outlaw, helped to organize the VR Privacy Summit in 2018. There was the intention to try to write a, a privacy bill of rights, um, it's kind of bringing together 50 people from the XR industry to kind of solve privacy. And uh, it was a little overambitious, and nothing sort of came out definitive because privacy is such a, a hard topic to tackle. Um, and in January of 2019, I went to the American Philosophical Association and the, one of the founders of philosophy of privacy, Dr. Anita Allen, was giving a presidential address about the philosophy of privacy in digital life. And you know, she was basically saying that there's no comprehensive philosophy of privacy and it's essentially missing and scarce. And it was like her call to action to the philosophical community that this is something that the philosophers need to take up and start to think about this as a comprehensive um, philosophical framework for privacy. Uh, then 2019, I went to the Laval Virtual Visionaries Think Tank where we did all these brainstorms around ethics and all the different contextual domains and kind of used a taxonomy that I used from the uh, ultimate potential of VR as a question that I ask and sort of mapping all the different domains of, of how VR is gonna be applied and then kind of map that out roughly into these different ethical issues. And then throughout the course of that year of 2019, continue to kind of develop this into this XR ethics manifesto where kind of map out all these different contextual domains and list all the different ethical and moral dilemmas of XR as much as that we could sort of brainstorm from, you know, in conversation with the community. Uh, and then uh, I was uh, working with the IEEE Global Initiative on the Ethics of Extended Reality for over two years. I was on the executive committee and we sort of broke out that, those different contextual domains and wrote specific white papers, uh, eight white papers on all these different issues and did a 14 hour podcast series with those authors kind of unpacking it. Uh, it's a little bit too much to cover here and so I'm, I'm just mostly, mostly focusing on privacy mostly because I feel like that's the area where we need the policy to come in. A lot of the ways that these issues can be solved technologically but the privacy issue is one I think we actually need sort of some intervention. So understanding presence in VR uh, is something I've talked a lot about in terms of you know, understanding VR. I gave a whole talk at the StoryCon at a primer of presence. Um, Mel Slater has this whole place illusion and plausibility illusion, which is essentially that the place illusion is that you have the strong illusion of being in a place, and the plausibility of illusion is that what you see is actually happening even though you know it's, it's not. And so there's a lot of illusionary framing that Slater has that I sort of philosophically disagree with, but we'll get into it here in a little bit. Um, Dustin Chertoff did a whole PhD uh, survey of all these different presence concepts. Um, and then he was looking to experiential marketing where they had things like sense, feel, act, and relate. And then from that, he took those and kind of developed uh, those into sensory, cognitive, effective, and relational. You sort of see a way that um, you kind of frame those in these different ways of active, cognitive, relational, sensory, and effective. And I kind of independently came up with a very similar presence framework um, based upon the elements of active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, and embodied and environmental presence. So a little bit of a taxonomy of the presence where you kind of think of the existing communication media where you have video games, it's all about expressing your will and agency out into the world. Um, you have the mental and social presence where you use language and communication through social media or uh, write, written uh, language in books or you have the computers and podcasting, and then the emotional presence is, like with film, you're kind of passively receiving a film where it's a building, releasing attention and modulating your emotions through music and pacing and editing and lighting. Um, and then you have the uh, embodied environmental presence, which is uh, pulling in aspects of architecture and theater and dance and integrating all the different sensory experiences um, with VR. 
So when we think about VR, it's well, when we think about these, it's like taking choices, make, or taking action, making choices, emotional immersion, and sensory experience. We look at AR and VR, it's sort of encompassing all these other previous media, and each of these have like a center of gravity, what they're focusing on. And so you can start to look at these, you know, framing a presence to understand the nature of each of these different media. So uh, Richard Scarbez did a whole survey of different presence concepts in 2017, uh, had a little bit of a taxonomy for he's, how he starts to make sense of it, and then I sort of went through and started to you know, put those different presence concepts into this framework, and you can kind of reference that in the slides later. Okay, now, so moving on to the biometric data from XR and NeuroRights, this is where I think the rubber hits the road in terms of what kind of keeps me up at night in terms of the implications of XR. So I went to the Future of Neuroscience and VR conference by the uh, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research in 2019, and they had a neuroscience there. It was showing this latest research that was, you know, kind of implanting these different nodes into the brain, and so you have people who are just thinking a thought, and from that thought, you're able to use AI to do the speech synthesis. So it's able to basically translate your thoughts into words. So it's essentially mind-reading technology. Um, Meta, uh, at the time, Facebook and F8 in 2017 was showing the sort of early prototypes of what if your brain could, could uh, you, you'd think and it could type. So this idea of this brain-computer interface, they eventually um, stopped that in 2021, but they were working on these kind of invasive um, XR technology, or you know, kind of neural technologies. There was a non-invasive neural interfaces ethical considerations conference that I went to in 2021, where I saw um, Project Galea from OpenPCI, you know, integrating all these biometric sensors into a VR headset. This headset costs around $25,000, and so it's in the more of an enterprise scale. But we see this fusion of things like EOG, EEG, EMG, and uh, temperatures, and there's all these things that they were categorizing what those were actually doing, and so I. Uh, took the opportunity to sort of do a, a brief survey of all the different types of biometric and physiological data. This is mostly in the medical context, but the idea is that you have a lot of this data that is going from medical context into the consumer context. And so what used to be covered by HIPAA laws is now sort of in a consumer product. So what are the implications of that? So I started to uh, apply the presence framework into some of those different things like active presence or being able to track different aspects of your behaviors, your intentions, your actions, and your movements, your mental and social presence from your mental thoughts, your cognitive processes, your cognitive load, and social presence. The emotional presence is the affective states and emotional sentiments and the facial expressions and the micro expressions. And then embodied presence is a lot about the stress arousal and uh, physiological reactions, eye gaze, attention, body language, and muscle fatigue. These are all the different things that XR is sort of um, understanding from that data and being able to feed back into these immersive experiences. So then you have Rafael Yusta and the Morningstar group that has these proposed neuro rights that are trying to push back against like what are the human rights frameworks to be able to have an idea for how to put some guardrails into some of this neurotech for, so they have the right to identity, the right to agency, the right to mental privacy, and other things uh, beyond the neuro privacy into like the fair access to mental augmentation as well as the right to um, you know, protection from algorithmic bias. So Inica has a whole taxonomy of these neural rights, and it's integrating all these different philosophical concepts like cognitive liberty and agency and free will and identity and mental privacy that have to kind of be defined in order to actually write some laws about some of this stuff. And so when I apply the presence framework, you have like uh, active presence where you have agency, free will, uh, mental social presence, you have the mental privacy, cognitive liberty, freedom of thought, mental freedom, mental integrity, psychological continuity, continuity, and then the embodied presence is the personhood, neuroprivacy, and personal identity. And there wasn't a lot within the neural rights that's focusing on emotions right now, but with XR technologies, with facial tracking and everything else, it's certainly going to be having a lot of that, um, th those feelings that may be you know, connected to needs as well. Now, algorithm bias, I think, is maybe a little bit separate than the neuroprivacy aspects, but that's certainly you know, a consideration. And there's, you know, kind of axes of privilege and domination and oppression that help to understand some of these dynamics of uh, bias harms for these um, marginalized and underrepresented communities that are kind of facing the brunt of all the, the, the you know, people who may be uh, gay in a certain context that may, you know, uh, if that's revealed, that may be threatening their lives. And so what are the bias harms as well as access to technologies? So psychographic inferences from eye gaze data, um, I know that Avi is going to be talking a lot about this in a lot more detail, but the idea is that you could take the eye tracking data and have things like gender and age and all this other psychographic information that is being inferred from that eye tracking data. Well, back in uh, IEEE uh, 2021, there was a paper and a poster that was from Meta that was showing how you could just take hand tracking data uh, and combine it with head pose data and be able to extrapolate through AI the eye gaze data. So if you think about all those biometric inferences from the eye gaze data, now if you just have hand pose and head pose, you have eye gaze data, which is sort of fusing all this thing together. 
So the idea is that um, you have all these different biometric inferences and that you may think that it's pretty innocuous to have just body movements, but those body movements could be referring to all these other aspects of mental privacy and it's gonna be a sensor fusion in the XR ecosystem that is tying all these different things together. So Meta has a whole non-invasive neural interface with the um, control labs. It's an EMG sensor that you put on your wrist and it's able to isolate down to an individual motor neuron. What that means is that you can just think about moving and that thinking, that thought about moving, the intention to move, can actually trigger a movement within a virtual context, either through a human computer interaction with augmented reality or within a virtual environment. And so what's it mean to be able to, um, for a company to be able to detect intentions to move? Um, now, uh, Mark McGill has a whole bystander privacy spectrum, and so if you think about, you know, sort of neural rights, it's been focusing on a lot of your privacy, but when you have AR, you have these sensors that are put out into the world, and you have that same problem of what kind of ways are you going to be able to detect other people's privacy as bystanders, and so he has a whole spectrum of ways that you can start to see uh, and make sense of this kind of bystander aspect of some of these privacy rights. All right, so reality, process philosophy, and, in, and inferences. And so David Chalmers has a book called Reality Plus where he's saying that, genu that virtual reality is a genuine reality. Um, so it's not sort of a separate or you know, less than real, but it's just as real. Now, if you look at a lot of the literature within virtual reality, you have the, the famous Milgram Casino, where on the one hand, you have the uh, real environment, and the other end, you have the virtual environment. And this is something that Chalmers is disagreeing with. And instead of saying the virtual versus real, it should be focusing more on the, the, the physical versus the virtual. And that's because if you look at all these different qualities of presence, you can have just as an engaging amount of agency, interaction, or being able to communicate with other people, connecting to them, or have a sense of plausibility or emotional engagement. And it's that, that sense of embodied environmental presence that's really the differentiating factor between the virtual versus the physical. So there's gonna be a lot of ways in that, that that comes up again and again in terms of how the law is being applied. But um, process philosophy for me is something that has provided a lot of inspiration in terms of this paradigm shift into not just full, solely focusing on the physical, uh, you know, tangible reality. And one of the ways that I like to think about it is that, you know, with Western metaphysics, you have material reality as the basis of reality and that you have this stack on top of it. But with process philosophy, they're basically saying that um, you can use the fundamental building blocks of process and potential to be able to describe all of reality. So that from the Big Bang to our consciousness, but it, it's like these uh, fractally nested processes that are kind of unfolding. And it's a way of understanding consciousness and context and relationships. But rather than focusing on these uh, objects and entities and properties on top of it, you're focusing more on the contextual relational dynamics of things. And so I think process philosophy is a, a big paradigm shift that helps to maybe provide some broader context when we think about these different aspects of privacy. <clears throat> um, there's a book by Eastman there. He talks about like physical things are the outcomes of real quantum events. And there's a whole uh, talk that he gave to philosophers that are kind of digging into the more of the nuances of Whitehead and process philosophy, which is way beyond the scope of this lightning talk. So Britton Heller has the whole um, you know, biometric psychography, which most of the biometric laws are kind of that object-oriented way of looking at how um, can this information reveal different aspects of someone's identity, so personally identifiable information, but there's not as much information or focus on how there's those more relational dynamics of uh, the likes, dislikes, preferences, and what she's terms of biometric psychography. So this is a term that needs to be more fully uh, uh, developed and defined in order to build some of these laws to handle some of these different biometric inferences that are coming from the data. So you have this identity versus biometric psychography, and you have this sort of static versus dynamic, and kind of the uh, personal identifiable versus the more you know, character traits, more immutable versus the transit, and something that's um, stored for other uh, versus uh, being processed in real time. And a lot of the ways that Meta is emphasizing their privacy engineering is to mitigate those different types of uh, PII leaks. And so they'll, they'll say, say things that the raw images will never leave, uh, your headset and um, that it's processed in real time, which is great for the third party doctrine because it's not being sent up to a third, um, to a server and have access, but they're not making any promises that they'll never do any biometric inferences on that data, which is real where the real goal is gonna be to be able to do the inferences of what the meaning of that data is. And what happens to those inferences is something that I think is a big gap that hasn't been necessarily addressed in what Meta and their public rhetoric around that. So no, I, I've done a few interviews with uh, um, process relational philosophers uh, to dig into more information about that. 
All right, so some metaverse frameworks. I'm a fan of Matthew Ball's definition where he goes through, and the big thing that I think is unique is that he's adding different economic elements, which I haven't seen as much as people have talked about it. And, and Dr. Nita Allen, as she talked about her comprehensive uh, framework, she wants to include both the information sciences, but also elements of the psychology, sociology, economics, and law. And I'm a fan of uh, Lessig's pathetic dot theory, where he's bringing in different elements of the cultural norms, the law, the market, and the technology, architecture, and the code. And I'm doing a little bit of a, a nested context of seeing how all these things are connected together. So you start with the earth, and then within the earth you have the culture, and then the laws, and then the economy uh, is built in the context of all these other things. The design guidelines, the network architecture, XR hardware, operating system code, app code, and then user experience. And so you kind of think of this as a metaverse stack that has all these different um, spheres that are all uh, connected together. And you can start to kind of break it out and see how the human rights principles are feeding into the government's laws. You have the design principles that are have the third party developers. And you can kind of get into much more of a mapping, uh, relational dynamics of all of like, here's how we start to conceive of um, the, uh, the privacy in XR and how do we need a new federal privacy law? What happens to contextually where AI? Are you monetizing the biometric data? And how do you keep the third party de developers in check? So um, the last two sections here, contextually where AI versus privacy, uh, Meta has shown these kind of um, speculative um, you know, videos thinking about like, what if you have egocentric data capture and you are tr uh, built, uh, you're, you're, you're cooking, uh, but you've already added salt and it knows you've added enough salt and so it's telling you not to add something. And so, so they have this question, where did I put grandma's watch? So it's this idea of episodic memory with AR where it's recording everything that you've ever done and that you could ask it where you put the watch and it's you know, showing you what's in this cabinet here and it's kind of annotated on top of that. Um, so there's an Ego 4D, which is Meta's egocentric POV research project that is able to an answer these questions of what happened when, what do I do next, uh, what am I doing now? Who said what, when, and how are we interacting? And so these aspects of context have been, uh, so Meta is seeing that this contextually where AI is kind of the future of human computer interaction. So it's gonna be able to understand what your current context is and how you interact with the world. And context is a big thing in the, in the context of the philosophy of privacy. Dr. Ian Allen says that there needs to be context specific applications of these different privacy frameworks. Um, Daniel uh, Solov uh, talks about how he's taking more of a, a bottom up approach of thinking about the context rather from top down. Also, any solution he has for privacy needs to be uh, contextually, contextual without being over, overly tied to specific contexts. And then uh, Helen Nissebaum's contextual integrity is talking about how privacy is all about the appropriate flows of information given what those contexts are. But when we think about context, how do we start to understand or define those? Um, you know, Helen Nissebaum says she doesn't want to define them or be too prescriptive. Um, Kalia Young, identity woman, says that identity is all about uh, identity being socially constructed and contextual. And, and Nissenbaum starts to list out some of those contexts, um, and in the privacy framework is starting to list out some of those, but again, it's, it's, it's this question is what are the role of context as we start to think about some of these different questions? And what are the privacy guardrails if you have uh, always on contextually or aware, uh, aware AI that is trying to dissolve all boundaries of what the context is? All right, so the final thing is some of the challenges for privacy legis legislation. Do we need a comprehensive philosophy of privacy like uh, Dr. Neil, uh, Nita Allen is su suggesting to be able to define those legal guardrails uh, for XR and neurotech? Um, how do we define and, and regulate some of these philosophical concepts like cognitive liberty, agency and free will, identity and mental privacy? Um, Susana Zuboff is talking about the unprecedented, na unprecedented nature of surveillance uh, capitalism, which is the uh, driver of a lot of these technologies and how do you mitigate against that? Um, Khalid Ridge Dilemma, which is, you know, you don't want to control things too early, but you don't want to wait too late because then it gets adopted and it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. So you have this very uh, small window to be able to make some of these different changes, which then kind of leads to the technology pacing gap, which means that the technology companies are kind of pushing forward and we don't have the conceptual frameworks or the legal frameworks to kind of be able to pull that back. And so um, there's some hope in looking at back at some of the different design documents for how the EU developed GDPR. There's a paper called Towards a, D a New Digital Ethics where they're defining dignity and how that feeds into this feedback loop of ethics and privacy engineering. Um, but, and, and there, there was also just this recent thing this past week where Meta is being sued um, and is GDPR, GDPR gonna be enough? Are they gonna overturn it? How can it be enforced? And will there need to be new business models as we think about some of these different technologies?
And as we talk about here, we're trying to come up with both the ethical design principles and the human rights principles that are fitting into these, these laws as we start to move forward with XR. So this is all that we covered, and with that, I'll sort of push it back to the rest of the conference. So thank you. Thank you.